Come on, you stupid piece of garbage. What's wrong with you, you dumb car? Jeez, what is the problem? When last we were working on this engine, ooh. we cleaned everything up and prepared the block for uh, assembly. Everything's clean, scrubbed, deburred, painted, ready to go. Now we're going to do the part that really makes the most sense where we should have started. We're going to roll the block over and we're going to measure all the pistons and the bores and test fit the crankshaft, test fit the pistons, which will have to be assembled onto the rods. The disc kit uses floating pistons so we don't have to press fit everything, which will make everything a whole lot easier. So as you can see, I've already put a main stud kit in this, which is wasted effort because I'm not going to use the main studs when we're test fitting the crank and the rotating assembly. What I'm going to be checking for on the bottom end when we are test fitting everything is to make sure that the rotating assembly has clearance for the bottom of the, the cylinder bores here in the cylinder case area all the way around. So we're going to take all the main caps back off and I'm just going to use the number two and four main cap and I'm just going to use the factory bolts with the bearing with some oil on it just to keep everything from getting scratched. Uh, might use assembly lube, doesn't matter. All we're doing is putting everything in to check for clearance to see if we need to grind out any of this middle area here which is where I suspect things will hit and check for clearance here at the pan rail. Then once we're done with that we can start assembling the bearings in the main caps with the stud kit and checking for proper crush and we're going to measure the, the diameter inside of each bearing and each pin on the crank with the hope that we don't have to send the crank out to be clearance anymore or have to mix and match bearings to get bearings that have the right oil clearance for the bottom end. I don't have clearances memorized. I have a factory assembly manual for a 79 Chevrolet, it's the factory 79 Chevrolet all cars manual. And I'm gonna use all the oil uh, clearance specs for a 350 Chevrolet from that because this essentially is the same thing as a 1979 block. It's the same basic architecture. I'm just using that to get the oil clearance specifications, the piston clearance to the bore specification, and then all the torque specifications for the fasteners. I'm going to be using ARP specifications for those, using also ARP's lubricant on the threads. So I'm going to move everything around, set the camera up, and we're going to start measuring things, and we'll go from there. Okay, these are the pistons we're using. These are, come with the Eagle Rotating Assembly Kit. Now, I've got some writing on them. What I've already done is I've taken each piston and I weighed them on a digital kitchen scale to get the weight. This one measured 658 grams, 659 grams, 657 grams. So they're all a little bit different. My logic is I'm going to, I've done the same with the rods. This one is 556 grams, but it's light. I wrote on it light. So it was this one was vacillating between 555 and 556. So the plan is to match the heaviest piston with the lightest rod crossing. So I have the lightest piston with the heaviest rod and the heaviest rod with the lightest piston so that they're all somewhat matched. We're talking differences here of one gram, sometimes two. I don't think for this engine that it's going to make any difference. These, these rods, I'm going to check with the bearing in them to make sure that the oil clearance is correct on the crank. And then these are floating. 
so I don't have to press fit them. So I have the luxury of mixing and matching them. But I think that again, that for this engine, a street engine, the realistic goal for this engine is 450, 475 horsepower. We're not looking to move the world here. This is not a thousand horsepower small block. I'm just looking for something to be reliable. I think I'm just overthinking that. Now, what we're going to do is measure these pistons. And I have three calipers here. This is a very nice brown and sharp caliper that I borrowed from my friend James, who was here earlier today, but he's not feeling very well. I have a cheap dial caliper, and then I have one of these Chinesium digital calipers. What I want to do is I'm going to use the good brown and sharp to measure all of these. And I've already gone through once, and I've written the measurements on some of these. So I'm going to measure them. And then I'm going to double check with my two cheap calipers just so I have reference to see if these are as where these are in level of accuracy compared to this good brown and sharp caliper. And what I've already done is I've double checked to make sure this resets back straight to zero. Okay. So small block Chevrolet 350. The bore size should be 4.0 inches. What I'm going to do is I'm going to measure around the skirt at the widest part. Technically, there should be a little bit of a taper to a piston. And we can do it at the top, we can do it at the bottom, just to see if that holds true. And I'm going to measure each one and write the measurement on the crown in Sharpie. And then when I measure the bores in the block, I'm going to put, I'm going to try to match the piston size to the bores if there's any discrepancy. I'm expecting the pistons to be the same, but variance in the block. So this first one, and I need my glasses, so I can read this. And this measuring 4.00 inches, okay? So now I'm gonna use this cheap caliper, it's at zero. And this is just so I know if this caliper is accurate or not. And it measures 4.0 inches. So this one that I really don't use very much is fairly accurate. Now I'm going to test this one. And it is in metric. It is in inches. So we're going to roll this out. This should go out to six inches. So we're going to double check this one, see if this measures four inches as well. 4.001. So this one's fairly accurate too. So I could come in here and write on this 4.0. Because I have the digital measurement on this one. This one I've also measured. We'll measure it again with the cheap caliper. 4.000. Now let's roll over to the top side. And at the crown, 3.950. So there is some taper to this, which is why we measure at the bottom side where it's the widest because we want the widest fit when we're comparing to the, uh, the cylinder block, 4.00. And this one's reading 4.00. Okay, so now I'm going to measure all eight pistons the same way and make sure that they're all to that they should be 4.00 inches. Okay, I've referred to the factory service manual for the maximum clearance, and it's 0 0.0007 to 0.0017 clearance between the bore and the uh, piston. So we're going to set this, the good caliper, to 4.008, 4.08. Okay, and then we have set up 
a spacer and a mandrel so that this fits in there. I've locked this caliper so that we can put this in and rock it down into place. Okay, so that will fit. Now we need to add to that a measuring device. Okay. So we're going to put this in, turn it on, and then put this in, get it straight as we can. Made that sound easy. A little finicky. Take your time. Come on. And then we're going to zero it. Okay. Now, okay, now we're coming over here to the bore. We're going to put this in and measure. And I'm back at zero at the top. There, zero at the bottom. And then, if you really want to, you can do it at 90 degrees to see if it's true or right around. Zero. Zero. And then we'll do this with each cylinder. Now what that's going to tell us is that the oil, the piston to cylinder wall clearance? See, there's zero again. Is correct. So this block is going to be within spec. Now I do need to go ahead and hone it. That's not going to change this diameter enough to move it outside of this, the set clearance. Uh, but we're not going to hone it until we test fit the crank. Zero. zero. Okay, so I'm going to do that to all eight cylinder bores. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take each individual piston. Since we've measured them all and they're all within spec, all the cylinder bores measured within our oil clearance. So there should be no difference in any of them. So I'm going to test fit the piston in each bore that I want to put it in. Since it doesn't have a difference, I've got these set out according to weight. And I just want to make sure that these pass freely in and out. So that one's a little bit stiff right there. But I also haven't honed it, so let's see how it does in the next piston. All right, so we're going to put this one, we're going to move that one over one. Let's see if this one fits this board better. Yeah, that's better. We just want to make sure since these are these are not press fit pistons, these are floating pistons. We have the ability to move these around in the block as we feel just however we want to. So I'm just going to find the ones that fit the bores the best. See, because they just drop in so nice, that means I'm not going to have any trouble in assembly. And they're all close enough with inspect that I'm not worried about having the piston swapped here because of clearance. I think really it's just a little bit of gum buildup right here that the hone's going to knock down on that one, which is why that one's a little bit snug. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put the pistons on the rods. And then we're going to start move forward to test fitting the crank. All 
All right, most ball block Chevrolets, the pin is held in place by uh, heating up the rod and the piston and then pushing it in whenever we, when these are expanded. These are uh, bushed and take a just a regular um, regular locking ring that you use uh, the pliers to grab like that, close it in, and then you fit that down into just a slot in a groove in the piston. Almost have it. Like that. Then the piston should there. Okay. So this one is going to go in number one. So we want the connecting rod to go on so that the chamfer, see these are offset, and there's a big chamfer on one side and a small chamfer on the other. This is going to fit the, the radius on the crank, okay? This being number one, the number one bank is forward on the small block Chevrolet. So this rod has to go in the piston like this. And we need this piston to go in there like that with the valve reliefs up to clear the piston or the, uh, the cylinder head. So let's put... Pin to slide in. Well, we get a little tap. No, nope, that's not right. It shouldn't be that tight. All right, I gotta figure out what's going on here. Okay, I got it in there. It was um, just a little bit stiff. So hopefully the rest of them won't be that much of a challenge. All right, snap ring pliers, snap ring. Uh, let's see if we can get this to go down in there. Problem is, once the pin is in place, getting the snap ring to go down in there, there's not much clearance in there. There. Got it. Nope, don't quite have it. I have a brass punch. There. Just enough to get the tap down in. And that's going to be number one. Now all I got to do is repeat that process for the other seven cylinders. All right, we have all eight piston rod assemblies assembled. Over here on the block, I've already started putting in the bearings. I've got the rear main bearing installed. I took my micrometer to the crank and I measured it 2.457, no, 2.447. Then I used a snap gauge and the calipers and the mic, and I found 0 .03, 0 .003 clearance 
which is within spec according to the book for the rear main. So I'm going to do that to the other mains and then again with the rods. Put the bearings in and measure. I've been using the snap gauge to measure inside the opening. Measure in here. The snap gauge, loosen the lock. This is really hard to do one handed. Okay. Then put the gauge in. Again, not easy to do one handed. So we're on the bearing surface and not on the um, oil surface. There, okay. So we get it in there. And we tighten it up. You kind of wiggle it back and forth so it feels like it's at its tightest right there. Anyway, that's tough to do one-handed. Then you come back and you measure it either with the mic or the caliper. And you find your clearance. And the difference, so take this number and sub subtract this size from the measurement you get with the snap gauge. And that's your oil clearance between the two. And then you compare that to your service manual or whatever reference ma manual you're using to ensure that you have the right oil clearance between those two and it's different on small block Chevrolet the rear and the front have different clearance specifications than the middle um, three bearings so you have to measure each one and double check your specification against each one and my mic or my uh, yeah, my micrometer leaves these little fine scratches, but you can't feel them. You can see them, but you can't feel them. So I think we're going to be okay. So I'm going to measure all the rest of these one at a time because, as you can see, trying to get in there to work, you kind of need the other one out so you can get in there. It's hard enough to do two-handed. It's even worse when you're trying to hold a camera and do it. Okay. We have mocked up two rods and pistons with the crank, uh, we don't have rings on it. Um, what I'm seeing is, as you can see I've marked it, right here, that counterweight is really, really tight. Really tight. So I've marked it, I'm going to grind that back. Also, on every bore, this corner right here is also very close. Again, it doesn't touch, but it's really close. So I'm going to clearance where that spot is on all of the bores. Not much, just a little bit right there. Then, even harder to see, There we go. See where I've got that black sharpie mark right here? You can't see it. I can't get the camera in there to, to see it. But when it rotates around, this connecting rod is coming across down there really close at that side. So I'm going to pull this all back out and on all of them I'm going to go ahead and hit this corner and down there that corner and then right here at the pan rail clearance this just a little bit just so we don't have any tightness and then we can clean it up and we can hone the block and go from there okay it wasn't that fun I had fun all right I went ahead and treated this like two four-cylinder engines that are mirror images because that's what it is. So I cut back this pan rail area here, radius it back off, 
And then these were the trouble areas on this bank. You see I've ground them back and rolled them over so they're smooth. And I did the same on the other side to the similar area. And then down here, these are, it looks a little chewy, but that is rounded over. Trust me, you can't feel it through the internet. Um, but I cut all those back, rounded all the edges, and again, I did the same on, well, this side didn't have it because of the oil pump, the same area on this side. So the next thing to do is we're going to roll the engine back over and get out the hone and lube it with some ATF and go ahead and run the, the cylinder hone through the bores. And then when it's not raining tomorrow or, yeah, probably tomorrow, I'll come back out here and we'll wash everything down again and then we'll be ready to assemble okay got cross hatching in all the bores now got all that little bit of surface rust from it sitting open knocked out um, of course everything's filthy again but we kind of knew that was going to happen so now um not going to do it right now because it's raining outside and I don't want to stand in the rain while I get wet while I'm cleaning this up. Take it outside, scrub it down again um, with soap and water just to get all the, um, any debris that could be anywhere on it. Any grinding dust from this, any grinding from making that clearance modification. And then we'll, uh, we'll be ready to start final assembly. We have finished all of the block prep, a little surface rust there. It's been a few days, it's been a busy week with work. Um, we're back to work on this. Today's project is we're going to uh, gap all the rings, we're going to install the cam bearings, and then we're going to roll her over, actually we'll probably roll it over to the cam bearing, and then we're going to start working on setting the crank in the block. Um, first step is we're going to start with gapping all the rings. Now, what I've done I've already gapped some of the rings, but I've got to gap the top rings. So what I've done is I've gapped the bottom ring. Now they make a tool to set the rings in place. Um, let me bring you closer. This is the uh, number one cylinder bore, just because that's the one I'm looking at. doesn't matter. I have already done the hone on all the cylinders with our uh, cylinder hone. Run it with a drill, put some light oil on it. Uh, whatever kind you like. Automatic transmission fluid works good. Regular penetrating oil like a WD-40 or something like that will work. Then we carefully put the ring into the bore and then they make a tool to step it down. But I take the piston upside down, put it in the bore and push it down a ways to make sure that that ring is square. Now you can see in there, there is a gap. That gap has to be measured correctly, okay? Now this engine is not going to have nitrous, it's not going to be boosted, so we can use the stock gap from the service manual. So let me show you that. I happen to have a print service manual. You can get this online, you can look all these up, but I happen to have a service manual for this car, well, for a Camaro. Uh, small block Chevrolet is going to be all the same. So we're going to look for the compression ring gap, and it's got the minimum and maximum for the top and for the second ring. And what I generally do is I take two sets of filler, filler gauges, or take one apart. I just happen to have two of them. Um, they're cheap, whatever. Go get so these generic filler gauges from any of the usual parts stores, wherever. And I set one at my thickest and one at my thinnest. So I have a minimum and a maximum. So then I'm going to take the feeler gauge and I'm just going to stick it in that gap. Which is tough to do when you're trying to hold a camera. Okay, so it doesn't fit in, or it fits into that gap like that. Okay, so we know it's there. This is our maximum. Well, this is for the top ring, that's the middle ring. So then I, I use these as a go no go. So the thickest one should not fit, okay, but the thinnest one should fit. 
So you know you have, you're within your minimum and your maximum. And if you are doing a boosted application, nitrous application, something like that, it's important to know exactly what your ring gap is. For this naturally aspirated application, all we need to know is that we are within the tolerance between the smallest and the biggest. Exactly what it is isn't as important to me. We just need to know that we have no more than the maximum and no less than the minimum. Okay, so now that we've got those set, I'm going to take all these rings out because these are the second ring and I'm going to put them on the pistons and then I'm going to do the top ring. Okay, so let me set the camera up and I'm going to show you how I'm going to put these onto the piston and we'll go from there. Okay, this is a finicky process. Um, the rods sitting out in the humid air here in the south, they've gotten a little bit of surface rust, but it's nothing major. I've kind of rubbed them down with a rag with some light oil on it, cleaned it up pretty good. Piston rings are going to have written on it top or a dot or something. Look at the instructions for what your ring kit says, and you're going to want to make sure you've got it correct. So you're going to give the ring a wipe down, make sure that there's no big debris on it. I've already wiped down this piston, so we know that that's the top. So I've got a set of the piston ring pliers. You can use just your fingers to do this, but the pliers do help because these are very easy to break. So you want to just get it started, and it is finicky finicky to get it done. Don't spread it crazy you just want to get it enough so you can get it started on the piston okay now we want this one to go down that went into the wrong groove that's in the top groove but that's all right there now I got it started in the right groove and I can take my pliers piston ring pliers these are also available in the auto parts store and spread that ring out again we're going to walk it around till we get it into the right groove. And you got to be very careful. I have broken a ring installing them, and that is very annoying because then you got to buy another set of rings to assemble your engine like that. And you got one on there. Okay. Right now it's real wide. I've already got the oil control rings on this. This has an expander ring in there which is that wavy ring. It's got two ends, and you want to make sure that when you put them together that they butt against each other. You don't want them to overlap. And then there's a support rail that's real thin that goes on the top and the bottom of that. And again, the gaps on those rails, you want them opposite each other. You don't want the two gaps for that support rail to be over each other because then oil can pass by. So you want them opposite. Same when we when we go to install this piston, we're going to make sure that the gap for these two rings are opposite each other so that they're 180 out. Now, rings will rotate as the, pist as the piston goes up and down, but you want to start off with them opposite each other. So that's one. I'm going to do the same with the other seven pistons and get all these middle rings on, and then we'll gap the top ring. I'll show you how we do that next. We're going to take all the rings and we're going to wipe them down, clean rag. We've already got one in that first bore on this side. And then we're going to work them into the bore gently. You don't want to scratch up your bore now that you've honed it. The chamfer on the deck helps a lot with this. And we want to get all of them started. We're going to take a piston, we're going to push them down. It's not so important how far they go down, but this is really just to make sure that the, the ring is sitting square in the bore. Okay? Now we're going to take our go-no-go -no -go gauges, our feeler gauges that we've got. And we're going to make sure that all these are within spec for our ring.
end gap. And these are a little wide, so I gotta do some research. Um, double check my measurements, make sure I've got my, my the right feeler gauges. If the gap is too tight, then you have to take a file or a ring gapping tool, I don't have one, but or a file, and file that opening a little bit bigger and make sure you knock all the burrs off because you don't want any sharp burrs on the edge of the ring. So I'm gonna double check my measurements because these are all measuring a little bit too wide. So I gotta double check that right quick. Once you've got all of your rings on, you wanna squeeze the ring and turn it and make sure it turns freely in the bore. See, I got a little mark right here. This piston, I got a little scuff on this wing ring land and I end up taking a razor blade and just barely rubbing the inside of that ring land so that this top compression ring would turn freely in there. You see how it's moving nice and smooth in there? It, it, it's really hard to do this one-handed. Anyway, you can you might can see as I squeeze the ring together and turn it, the ring is turning in that ring land. And you want to make sure these are all free in the ring land so that the ring itself doesn't bind up to the piston because that can make the piston stick to the wall, crack the top of the piston, crack the middle ring land. And with these pistons, there you can kind of see, between the top and the second ring is actually a groove. Um, and that would make this real easy to crack if these pistons, if these rings were bound up. So, I've got these back in the box. I have it marked the front of the engine. One, three, five, seven, two, four, six, eight. Um, so these are all assembled and ready to go. Um, the next thing is we got to put in the cam bearings. So let me set you up because we got to have a talk about that. There are a few times when assembling anything with a car where you really do need to have a specific tool. Um, I try to make do without having very specific tools for a lot of jobs. Sometimes you just have to have something specific. The cam bearings that go through the, the middle of the engine here are three different sizes. They're a very precise fit and they all have to be clocked so that the oil hole in the bearing lines up with the oil hole in the block. This is one of those times where you need a specific tool. A lot of people will go ahead and have a machine shop do this, and that's what I've always done in the past. But I found a camshaft bearing tool uh, on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, one or the other, really, really cheap, so I bought it. Looks like this. The tool goes through the middle of the engine. It has expanding collars that lock on to the bearing. It has a mandrel that goes on that you will attach the collar to. As you tighten the mandrel, the rubber part expands to grip it, grip the bearing, and then this shoulder holds it in place so you can drive it in. And then it has a tapered cone to make sure everything is centered. I'm gonna drive it in using a dead blow hammer. That's important because when you get your bearings, and I've already labeled the box, each bearing has an individual part number on it. Um, you can't see it. Look up the part number for the brand you're using and make sure you put the right bearing in the right hole. They have to go into the correct hole because the outside diameter is different sizes to fit into the block. One of the problems is the length of the tool, it will hit this plate. So I'm either going to have to take the block off the engine stand or adjust it to let the block drop and then turn it over to get through this notch in the engine stand. This is a homemade engine stand that my father-in-law made years ago um, because we've got to get them in there in exactly the right spot. I've never done this, so this will be fun. We've got to make sure all these the journals where these bearings go are cleaned out with a clean rag and carburetor cleaner, brake cleaner, acetone, whatever your favorite cleaner is. And then the 
that hole is for oil to come in and it has to line up with the hole in the block okay and you got to make sure it goes that way all the way through so you're going to lower the bearing in place turn it line it up assemble the tool and drive it in this is the first one so it goes here you can't just do it from the outside and you can't do it without the tool on the outside because if it doesn't go in perfectly straight if it's cocked at all it will distort this inner journal and your camshaft will bind up and you'll have you'll have to replace the bearing um i have seen on the internet where people have problems with brand new bearings still being too tight and they have to shave them i've talked with several friends uh who have built more engines than i have and they say that that happens like five to ten percent of the time with my luck it's going to happen to me they've always just taken a a, a a long thin razor blade or a pocket knife and just gently scrape it to get the clearance and they put the put the cam in dry and then turn it and then pull the cam back out if it's tight you'll see the shiny spot and you can go in there and just give a little bit of clearance you don't want to cut into this interior finish is made of a soft metal called babbitt you don't want to gouge it all the way through to the copper lining underneath so i've never done this um i might be about set a ruin might be about to ruin a set of bearings we'll find out um the first one is going to have to go in last because it has to go in the tool has to go in this way but i can do the other four from the front so we're going to start at the back and work our way forward making sure that this The centering cone, we want to make sure that it's in there so that when we hammer it, we're keeping that tool centered in this bore through the middle of the block. I'm going to try to set the camera up to look down in here as we go, um, see if I can get you some images. Okay, lessons learned. That wasn't as easy as I was hoping. Nothing ever is. Getting that oil hole lined up in the middle of the of the, the hole in the block is more challenging than you would think. I had to put the tool in and take it out 11 billion times to get that hammered in the right spot. And then I was paranoid that I'd overshot it because I didn't measure first. So the next, before I do this next one, I'm going to measure how far the, the hole is from the center line from whichever side I come at, probably from this side, from the, the casting web, so I know if I'm going deep enough or not. The other thing is each bearing has its own hole. you got to look up the part number to see what's right. And the hole has to be clocked in relationship to the oil hole in the block. And if you would focus... like that, there's a mark on the bearing which indicates that this goes up as you drive it in from below. I had marked that other one with the Sharpie. Now I double checked that with the service manual to see um, number two through four bearing, because that's what I'm doing next, position uh, five o'clock, position toward the left side, position with the bottom of the cylinder bore and that's hard to read when you're trying to keep the camera in focus <laughs> anyway um you can read that look it up paper manual whatever ebay it they're cheap anyway look up your part number look online see which part number goes in which one um when you open up the box, it doesn't indicate which is the front. I marked the box, so I have them in the box. They came in the box in the right order, but it didn't say that this was the front of the block or the back of the block. 
So I, ha I have marked the box with the front of the block. So I'm going to do this next one next. Um, set up the camera. I, I know I stopped the camera on the last one, but I was getting very frustrated and things went, weren't going well. So I'm going to reset up and I'm going to clean out this journal with my rag in carburetor cleaner. As you can see, it's got schmutz in it so we're going to clean that up real good wipe it out and when i'm done with all this i'm going to go in here and clean out all this the bottom side of this lifter galley to make sure i got all that clean because i don't want any of that babbit material loose in there and then i've got to do this last one since i was having trouble i've already repositioned the engine as you can see it's dropped down on the stand so this notch does clear the tool so once i get these done I can do the same thing, but I've got to go from this direction towards the front to do this one because you need this centering cone, well, centered. All right, my action camera, I think, is getting too hot. I've got it in a waterproof enclosure hanging off the toolbox. You can see I got the bearing in, and you can just see the edge there. You see that hole? I took my little 90-degree pick, and I reached it through that hole gently to feel for the groove slide the bearing tool out of the way it's right there and i tried to get that hole lined up basically in the center of the groove the service manual says to line it up at five o'clock blocks upside down so five o'clock is this way instead of that way so it lines up with the bottom of the cylinder bore case itself okay um what i'm reading online is if that's lined up straight up it will affect the oil flow and you have it offset so that it essentially meters the oil flow to the cam because this hole at the top of the main journal you're not going to be able to see it goes all the way through the into that the main oil galley down here and that's underneath the lifter valley if it's lined up you won't get sufficient oil to your main bearings and <laughs> what could go wrong there so it's time consuming, you, you, you put your tool in place, you tighten it up with the wrench, hammer it a ways, take it back out, check, put it back together, hammer it a ways, take it back out, check, and just go nice and slow to get it there. This rear one, since it's the first one I've ever done, it really gave me fits, um, but I finally did get that hole lined up with the main hole in the, in the block, which is what the manual says to do, because you can see this hole's offset, but all this whole back area where the oil pump goes, um, you know, going over the oil filter. There's an awful lot going on in here. So just do what it says. So line it up at five o'clock on these three middle ones. And then I think it says to go 12. Don't listen to me as gospel. Look it up. It's on the internet. You know, don't look at a reference. Always look at a reference. I got a friend, Kevin Cooper used to be a aircraft mechanic when he was in the Air Force. He said, never memorize a torque spec because you'll remember it wrong on something important. So always look up a torque spec. And something like this where you need to know the reference of which way that hole's supposed to go, look it up every time. Okay, got my camshaft with the long bolts in the end. I'm gonna put some assembly lube on this. Even though I'm gonna take it right back out, stick it back in the wrapper, it'll be all right. To have too much lube on it. Get the first two journals lubed up here. This is just a test fit, so we're not going to try to get everything perfect. We just want to get it in, see if it'll fit into the bearings. Okay. And this is also a roller cam, so when we do the final installation, we won't need lube on each lobe. So I'm guiding it in to each bearing nice and slow. It's going in pretty smooth. I'm only really worried right now. My concern is that back bearing that I might have messed up trying to install it because it was my first attempt at this. 
And they make a tool for installing your cam. It's a nice handle that bolts on. I don't have one. But I have this big bolt I found in my surplus bin. Which is going to have to be good enough for today. And then you can kind of sort of a little bit reach in. Not great. To kind of guide it. As it goes across. Carefully. And there it is. And it turns smooth. Which means I didn't mess up these bearings installing them. The cam fits. It, I don't have the back plug in yet. But it fits in. And it turns nice and smooth. It's got all this grease on it right now, so it's a little bit heavy. But that's good news. First attempt at doing cam bearings, and I didn't ruin it. My neighbor Paul's here to help me. We have the moment of truth has arrived. We have installed the bearings. We cleaned everything down with carburetor cleaner, installed the bearings, and we've oiled everything. We got the rear main seal in place. We will put RTV on it when we do the rear main cap. So the crank is clean. There's nothing to it but to do it. And we drop it. Piece of cake. Except it didn't sit. <laughs> There, that's it. Now we're in. All right, now we're going to put the stud kit in, clean the caps, and put the caps on. Okay, I've run all of these down with my little small impact set to its lowest torque setting, which is like 15 foot pounds. Um, ARP says torque these in three settings to a total of 80 foot pounds. Uh, I'm going to start in the middle and work my way out. I've got torque wrench set to 40 foot pounds. So I'm just going to start pulling on these and getting them tight. You see how loose that was from that first impact wrench. It didn't put any torque on it. And I'll pull on all these all the way around. And then we'll increase from 40 to 60 pounds. And then we'll do it again at 80 pounds. And that will be our final torque. Once we get to 80 foot pounds, I'll go around everything twice just to make sure everything is torqued right. Okay, we've already got one piston installed. Uh, we're going to take each piston, we're going to wipe them down, put uh, assembly lube on the bearing, we're going to soak everything in ATF, put on the spring compressor, drop it in. You want to, again, like I said earlier when I had problems with that one piston, make sure your rings are free and you want to clock your rings opposite each other. Now uh, you can read online, some want them here, here, and here, some want them opposite, doesn't matter. Do what you want. Um, I do them opposite. And we're going to go ahead and knock this bottom cap off, put some lube on it, clean it, and drop her in the hole. All right. Ready? Good. You got me? Got you. Don't let it drop down the cylinder wall. Got it. All right, coming down. Come on. All right, we'll pass the ring compressor. Try to ease up a little bit. Ready? Yeah, keep going. You got a little, you got a little bit more. Oh, oh. Looks like it needs in just a bit more. Oh, hold on. 
finger and it popped out. I did it? Yeah. Can you flip it over and take a look? Yeah, let's just, you just take a look. I don't know what the... <coughs> it's seated back in there, but... You go flip it over and you take a look and see how you like it before we cinch her up. Before we torque it. See how it's easy. All right. Cap. All right, now the same thing. This one, you want the big radius towards the back. So they off, they offset each other. Right. I see. Time to do the other six. I have it down pat. And then once again, make sure nothing's binding, nothing's touching. I really should just go ahead and put crank bolts on this. <laughs> the fact that I'm able to turn this by hand and nothing's touching tells me everything we need to know. Yeah. Okay, so that pin's next. 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 Fuck, you made a filthy, oily mess on my clean, painted block. It's all your fault. Well, somehow. All right. Nothing a rag can't fix, boss. This is true. 